Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today for this joint Chatham House, Comexi and GPS event. For those of you who are less familiar with Chatham House, just over a year ago we launched the Latin America Initiative, which aims to analyse the political, economic and cultural changes taking place across Latin America, and explain those and share those and discuss those with international stakeholders. Andres Rosenthal, Senior Advisor at Chatham House and Founding President of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, was integral to, to the development and success of that initiative. And Horacio Sanchez Caballero from the group of producing countries from the Southern Cone, who we're lucky to have here on the call today, has long supported Chatham House's work and has been a great source for generating ideas and insights on the region. So we're really excited to be hosting this event today in collaboration with both Comexi and GPS. This event is part of the Chatham House Global Trade Policy Forum, and we'd like to thank founding member AIG and supporting partners Clifford Chance, Diageo and EY for their generous support of the forum. I'm going to hand over to Veronica Ortiz from Comexi and to Horacio from GPS for opening remarks before introducing our two speakers. Veronica, over to you. Thank you, Laura, and uh, it's a pleasure for Comexi and uh, our former president and founder, Andres Rosenthal, to collaborate with Chatham House again, and now with GPS, the Grupo de Productores del Sur, in this uh, uh, event, and on one of the most pressing issues that we'll be facing as a humanity, and uh, which particularly affects Latin America, as you mentioned. And uh, I will just give you two figures. In, uh, due to the economic recession after COVID, it's, uh, uh, official estimates are that 10 million Mexicans will fall into extreme poverty. Uh, that figure rises to 83 million people in Latin America. So that's the size of the tragedy we'll be facing. And so what a more timely uh, seminar this is and we look forward to this uh, very enlightening conversation. Thank you again, and welcome to all. Thanks, and um, Horacio. Okay, well, good afternoon to all, and thank you for participating in this roundtable on food and trade. Special thanks to Chris Sabatini, Senior Research Fellow for US and the Americas, and Head of the Latin American Program for giving this possibility of discussing such an important issue. Thanks to Ambassador Andres Rosenthal for his inspiration and for suggesting the invitation of Ken Smith Ramos, member of COMEXI. Special thanks to Maximo Torero, Chief Economist of FIO. Laura Wallesley, we are really happy to have you as chair of this roundtable given your knowledge and always friendly attitude. It's a pleasure for GPS and me personally to participate in this important meeting. Being a member of Chatham House for the last 20 years and one of the founder members of William Pitt Group, I feel particularly happy for the creation of the Latin American program in Chatham House. I am sure that under the direction of Chris Sabatini, the Crober will present an important input for the House. GPS, Group of Producing Countries from the Southern Corn, is a net of private institutions from Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. We have been working on this field for the last seven years, providing information and organizing forums in order to discuss our agenda, which is focus first in the geopolitics of food, and second on a tri tripod of issues, climate change, agricultural practices, and trade. I say a tri tripod because the three legs must be considered together if we want to offer a balanced vision and proposals. The theme of this meeting is of great importance. 20% of food is traded today internationally. Thus, an efficient and competitive trade system is important. In particular, in our view, a sound agreement between net exporters and net importers is key 
to assure that people in those importing countries will have, I quote, at all times, physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutrition food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life, and quote, FAO. Among the key food trade players, the region comprising Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay is the major net food exporters of the world, representing 30% of total net exports. Our proposal is to have an open discussion, avoiding prejudices, distorting ideologies, and lack of well-based information. We are sure that we must defend and strengthen multilateralism based on rules agreed among all the participants. And in the case we are about to discuss today, agreements between net exporters and net importers are key. Together, we can work on solidarity instead of splitting. The international architecture of world institutions must be redesigned to be able to host all players who agree to work according to an international set of rules, linking, as I said before, sustainability, climate change, and food system. Nowadays, these dimensions in the international uh, field, in many cases, are treated separately. For example, FAO concentrates in agriculture, WT in commerce, WHO on the health and human diseases, UNEP in environmental. A sound correlation of these agendas must be convenient for a sound policy definition. And maybe the Food System Summit, of which will be organized by the United Nations in October next year, will be a good platform to discuss this issue. Finally, this must be based on dialogue and confidence. No institutional system can survive if it misses these two supports. Thank you. Thanks, Alessia. So today we have two outstanding speakers to shape the discussions. First up, we have Ken Smith Ramos. Ken is a member of COMEXI and has extensive experience in international trade negotiations. He began his career as part of the team negotiating the NAFTA, and he was General Coordinator of International Affairs of the Secretariat of Agriculture, where he was responsible for agricultural trade negotiations and international cooperation on agri-food matters. We then have Maximo Torero. Maximo is Chief Economist at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. He joined the FAO in January last year as Assistant Director General for the Economic and Social Development Department. Prior to that, he was the World Bank Group's Executive Director for Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. And before that, he headed up the Division of Markets, Trade, and Institutions at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute. So we're lucky to have you both, and we welcome you both. Ken, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, Laura. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Chatham House, GPS, Comexi. It's great to be in a panel where, with uh, good friends and colleagues uh, such as Andres, Veronica, Maximo. It's great to see Horacio. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk about uh, the global food system and trade after COVID. I thought the title of the webinar was very optimistic because it uh, actually uh, seems to think that COVID will go away, which we all certainly hope. But in all likelihood, we're going to have to learn to live with it. And, and it's interesting to analyze the situation, situation. food system, system. What that implies for trade, given what has happened precisely with the COVID crisis. Now, um, of course, in general terms, with the COVID crisis, what we have seen is a great level of supply chain disruptions throughout the world. Uh, luckily, I guess for the agricultural sector, agricultural production and trade has shown resilience. At the end of the day, people in a crisis still need to eat, and that's something that is a, a uh, universal truth. So we've seen uh, 
agricultural trade holds steady. There was actually an increase at the beginning of the year of about 2.5%, right before the big crisis hit. Uh, but nevertheless, we still have the big challenge of feeding the world. I mean, these challenges of food security continue and they can be aggravated by these supply chain dis disruptions because even though primary agricultural production is still going, you have important disruptions in everything related to processed foods and I will get a little bit into what's happening on trade. And we still have that challenge of by the year 2050 to be able to feed 9 billion people in the world. So the answer as recommended by the WTO, the OECD and other international organizations is to promote in the agricultural sector innovation and the adoption of technology. And of course, maintain free trade uh, throughout the world. So some of the good news happening in North America, of course, we have the entry into effect right in the middle of this COVID crisis and the, the biggest uh, economic crisis that North America has faced probably in the last hundred years. The entry of, into effect of the USMCA is useful because it guarantees for the long term uh, free trade between the three North American countries. Now, the USMCA itself helps because it uh, maintains free trade between Mexico and the US across all agricultural products. It also increases market access vis-a-vis -vis Canada in terms of uh, uh, primarily on dairy products where they still maintain important restrictions on, uh, so on the supply side. And uh, in addition to that, the USMCA helps with improved sanitary and phytosanitary measures to be able to maintain uh, important sanitary measures in place, but at the same time facilitating trade and making it easier, more transparent to obtain the re uh, required permits so that trade can flow across uh, countries. And most importantly in the USMCA, when we talk about this importance of innovation and technology, is that it includes a uh, section that the NAFTA did not have on agricultural biotechnology uh, cooperation, which is essential for the future of agricultural productivity and to be able to meet the food security targets over the next decades. Uh, so ag trade in North America was a success story under the NAFTA and we hope it remains so uh, going forward. However, that is the good news, but uh, we also have to point to the fact that both in North America and in the rest of the world, what we're seeing with the COVID crisis is quite a bit of an increase in uh, protectionism uh, it's normal in crisis. This has happened uh, ever since the Great Depression where countries start looking inward uh, when they're faced with economic crisis. And many times protectionism exacerbates, I would say most of the time, exacerbates the existing economic problems. So it's a vicious cycle that is created. And so we're seeing it in the USMCA. Unfortunately, there are important trade tensions between the US and Canada on whether Canada is complying with its dairy commitments in the USMCA. Between the US and Mexico, tensions are growing on the one hand because Mexico with a relatively recent government is pursuing policies that could be contrary to the spirit of the USMCA, both on uh, agricultural biotechnology permits, uh, the use of pesticides such as glyphosate, uh, on the U.S., there's quite a problem given that uh, there's pressure because of the U.S. presidential elections from agricultural producers to try to restrict Mexican exports. And the pressures are coming from a key political state, such as the state of Florida in the United States. So there's talk of uh, investigations that have been presented in the ITC, International Trade Commission, against Mexican blueberries, strawberries, and bell peppers. Throughout the USMCA negotiation, the US tried to push forward measures uh, called uh, seasonality provisions that Mexico rejected, but you know, that are rearing its ugly head again now in the context of worldwide protectionism and the situation with COVID. There's also the US-China trade war, which has had a strong impact on agricultural trade between the US and China. Uh, in terms of US exports, uh, they essentially collapse when you talk about beef, wheat, cotton, uh, soybeans has been also compromised. In addition to that, there's a big crisis with uh, African swine fever in China that is hurting hog production and therefore hurting the, the supply chain of soybeans and other, uh, other feedstuffs for uh, for the, um, the cattle sector and, and, pol and pork in, in China. So a lot of these elements are creating tensions when you see uh, the, the uh, recommendations that major international and agricultural organizations are, are recommending to the world in terms of maintaining open markets. So just to conclude this initial remarks, I think that some of the main elements that we should uh, sort of learn from the crisis and the situation that we're facing uh, basically, there's four main conclusions that I see. 
Uh, it would be a big mistake to cave to protectionist pressures in any country in the world. I mean, where I concentrated a bit on the North American landscape because that's uh, where I have uh, most of my experience, but obviously Mexico is an important trading nation across the world. We have uh, uh, 12 trade agreements with 46 countries and a vibrant uh, e economic exchange in the agricultural trade with many uh, countries in the world. So already agricultural applied tariffs in the world are higher than industrial applied tariffs. If you see the applied tariffs, they're more or less 7.5% versus 2.2% for industrial tariffs. So we have to be careful that we don't go in the protectionist direction given the economic crisis that we're living through. Another thing that I think uh, is key is that uh, government supports for agriculture should really focus on promoting innovation and adopting new technology. And that's something that we've been talking in different fora, whether it's the FAO, whether it's the, the G20, on the importance of adopting new technology, increasing productivity, and uh, you know, otherwise there's no way to reach these food security targets that we have set for, for the year 2040, 2050, because we all have to produce more with less arable land. So that's, that's a big focus and a big lesson that I see here. We also need to learn the lessons for the next pandemic or, or, or the COVID spike, which still has not gone away which is keeping borders open and having better regional coordination on the issues related to what are essential industries and how to handle potential lockdowns. In North America, even though it's a very integrated North American economy, we had a complete disconnect, in my opinion, between governments as to how to handle when the lockdown should come in, when it should start to be lifted, and what should be the criteria and protocols to reopen the economy. And this can really hurt all sectors, and it obviously can hurt the agricultural and, and, and food supply in the world. And the fourth conclusion is basically related to uh, the, the need to uh, reduce food insecurity. We still have over 800 million people in severe uh, uh, mal malnourishment throughout the world. Veronica pointed out to the 10 million in Mexico that are uh, added to the list of extreme poverty and over 80 million in, uh, in, the, in all of Latin America. So reducing food insecurity requires, first of all, economic recovery and growth in the job market. And an example that I like to give is that, uh, you know, the stocks of basic staples such as rice, wheat, and corn are rising. They're rising to uh, all-time highs. Yet food insecurity is growing because people are not having enough income to be able to supply the basic needs of a four-person family in many regions of the world. So these are some of the challenges that we face in the global food system and the, and the message is basically let's keep trade open, let's not cave to protectionist pressure at a time when we really need to continue opening borders in agricultural trade. I will leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Ken. Really interesting comments. Uh, Maxime, let's go straight to you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you very much for for the kind invitation. L let me let me uh, try to complement to what Ken has said. So let me first focus on what is the current situation in terms of cereal supply and demand. Why? Because what the COVID nineteen has shown is that despite uh, it has brought some logistical issues to the food and agricultural sector, uh, it has shown to be extremely resilient. So what is the situation today in terms of production? Today, in terms of production, we are heading, heading towards another record, 2,765 million tons up, 58 million tons to the previous year. Maize and rice outputs are forecast to reach new records, but a small production declines is expected for wheat, and that's mostly because of European Union. Utilization is forecasted to be 2,746 million tons. That means up to 0.4% with respect to the previous year, but still there is a balance which will help to accumulate into stocks. But the stocks, which was the major problem in 2007, 2008 food price prices, have been at the highest level and they have been growing in the last, in the last years. So by the close of 2021 season, they are projected to be increased even by 1.7% more. Now, it's important to understand that the stocks has grown across the world, but especially the major, uh, the composition of the growth is because of the growth in the stocks of China, but also the rest of the world has increased their stocks. So the conclusion of, of this assessment in terms of cereals is that food is available in the world. But what is happening to prices and, and what are the, the concerns we have today? In terms of prices, the FAO price index has increased uh, to 96 points, uh, but this still is down 30% from its peak 
which was in February 2011. And if we look by cereals, oils, sugar, meat, and dairy, in all the cases, we are significantly lower with respect to those to the peaks of those years. So for example, in cereals, the peak was in June 20, 2008, and we are 38% lower. In oils, the peak was in February 2011, and we are 44% under. In meat, the peak was in 2014, August, and we are 22% under. And in dairy, the peak was in February 2014, we are 35% under. So although we are seeing some increases in prices today, that is not reflecting a crisis like we have faced before, and is not reflecting a major issue. One important concern to look at is what is happening with exchange rate, because exchange rate is extremely important to understand where I am competitive in terms of exports or where my imports will be more costly. And what we observed until April was a devaluation of the exchange rate of the local currencies, meaning that we became more competitive in terms of exports, but it was more costly to import because the local currency was weaker. But what we are observing up to since August is the opposite, is that the local currencies are revaluating, which means that the export sector is less competitive, but the import sector is, is cheaper to import because the local currency are stronger. And that also means that countries could face uh, in a cheaper way the, their debt and the service to, to their debt. So that's good news for the developing countries within all the bad news that, that we are facing. So just to, to summarize those two elements, which I think are, are important is food is available, Prices are not at its highest. They are 30% lower than any highest point or even more. We have sufficient stocks, and that makes the sector resilient. Now, one of the logistical problems that still is there is the issue of a change of vessel crews. And that's a problem that we need to resolve quickly. And that requires that our system and our ports become ready for that. Because as it was mentioned before, the problem today is not that we have a lockdown. lockdown are basically being stopped. Uh, the problem today is that we are operating under a situation of COVID-19. And that means that we need to be prepared. So ports need to have the, the health measures in place to avoid this happening, and they should allow crews to be able to change with good testing equipments and good testing machinery. And that's affecting some countries in Latin America. There are some restrictions in Argentina still, in Colombia, and in Peru, which is something that we need to change because the region the southern corn, especially uh, of, the, of South America, is a key exporter of staple commodities, has been the one who has been growing in the last years to be able to decrease the level of concentration that we used to have in, in the export market. Now, what is the, the major problem for us? So the, 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 the food markets, food is flowing. Now, one of the major issues that happened uh, at the beginning uh, of the lockdown was the issue of export restrictions. Just to put in context, uh, in 2007 and 8, food crisis, there were 33 countries that would export any forms, different forms of export restrictions or constraints. That means around 20% of the share of the, pro, of the production that was traded was restricted, which was a huge problem and was one of the core reasons of the exacerbation of the volatility and, and the price. Today, in, at the beginning of the lockdown, we started with 22 countries with export restrictions, which meant around 5% uh, of the share of exports. Today, this is zero. Basically, we don't have major countries. But the major problem is that the risk is still there and we need to be very ready to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is to bring information of, of the stocks and the flow of information. It's essential that food can move. It's essential because it allows better use of natural resources, which is a constraint that we face today. It's essential because it will allow countries that cannot produce to be able to import what they need to import. So in that sense, the trade is is central. And we need to find ways in which we can accelerate and increase and, and, and promote a trade. But one major uh, importance of trade is intra-regional trade. And that could be a bigger solution to many continents that today are facing challenges because of the recession we are living, like Africa or like the Caribbean countries or even South America. There is a huge potential in inter-regional trade which will reduce distances and which could create the demand that we could be losing because of the recession. So with that, let me move to the second problem, which is the biggest problem today for us, which is the problem of, of access to food. So food is available, but what is happening with access? And that's where we are really concerned. Why? Because the recession that we're going to face, uh, GD, global GDP growth declining in minus 4.9% as, as expected by the IMF. But countries in the region like Peru in minus 12%, potentially up to minus 14. Argentina also with big figures, Chile with big figures of, of decreasing GDP. Although some countries like Chile or Peru could have financial resources to, to create a recovery, like some developed countries, uh, the recession that we are going to face at the global level is enormous. Just thinking of China, which is the biggest, biggest importer in the world, 
uh, growing at only 1% will mean that there will be a significant reduction in terms of, of imports of those countries, which will affect what we export. And that's something that we need to pay attention, not only because of, of course, of the food security issues linked to that, because people won't, ha won't have enough money to, to buy the food, but also because of the, the problem that we'll face, farmers will be facing because of lower prices. Now, it is true that today we are not yet observing that. Why? Because especially in the world of cereals, uh, China is have a strategy of restocking, uh, which is increasing the demand and therefore prices look okay. Even more, the problem of, 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 of the African swine fever and the depletion of, of the restock of, of, of pork meat has created a bigger demand, which also, of course, have a positive effect um, over feedstock. But again, in the medium and long term, we expect prices to stabilize and, and to start going down. And this is even worse in the case of high value commodities, where the reduction in demand will be very clear. And that will affect uh, producers of high value commodities, especially in the region will be uh, Peru, Chile, and Colombia, for example, that are key exporters of high value commodities. Now, and finally, the third point, which is the most, I think, <laughs> the central one, is that what is happening to, to consumers. And what we are, what we have, even before COVID-19, was 690 million people undernourished. We had 2 billion people that couldn't have access to regular food, and 3 billion people that couldn't buy healthy diets. The, the last point was about the consumers, and that COVID-19 uh, will increase undernourishment in 132 million more people from the 690 million that we have today, before COVID-19 it will increase the level of number of people that could not have access to healthy diets, which today is 3 billion people. And that puts a significant challenge, and a significant challenge for us to be able to be more effective in the way we target the most vulnerable countries so that we can provide them the food that is needed to be able to achieve SDG2. And that's why we need to move to a strong change and, and, and agri-food system transformation, where we bring together big data so that we can inform people real time what is going on in the sector, what is the amount of stocks available, which AMIS is doing a great job on that, but we need to keep accelerating that. But we also need to bring big data to bring solutions. We need to bring innovation because we need to be flexible. And we also need to bring technology. But nothing of that will work if we don't have governance behind. So we need proper governance, proper institutions, because it has to be inclusive. And that is directly linked to trade, because agriculture is one of the most distorted sectors in the world, if not the most. And we need to start removing those distortions and allowing the agricultural sector to work properly and accelerate uh, the trade facilitation and minimize restrictions to trade. It doesn't make any sense that if I want to buy a product from Guatemala, I have to go to another continent to import that product. It doesn't make any sense the same in Africa. If I have to buy a product from Africa, I will go to another continent. So again, my point, and just to finish, is that we need an agri-food system transformation that requires to bring together data, innovation, technology, and governance uh, so that we can accelerate this process because the challenges we're facing today is not only the traditional challenges of, of pressure from the urbanization, of climate change, and of environment, uh, our natural resources, which are in, in, in a pretty tight condition, but it's also this new thing, which is what we call surprises, that is making the agricultural sector to work under significant uncertainty. And that requires that we are prepared with a very, very uh, resilient food system that today we have, but not at the level that it should be. And we need to identify which are the core drivers to accelerate that resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Maxime. Thanks, both of you. Those were hugely stimulating uh, comments to open the discussion. We'd really encourage um, audience members to use the raise hand function and put some questions to the panel. I can't see any raised hands at the moment, so I'll put the opening question to the two of you, if I may. We, you've both pointed to the importance of um, cooperation, and Maxima, you talked a lot about the need to think about the resilience of the system, um, but also to focus not only on food availability, but food access. Do you think that there's a risk um, that from this crisis, the fact that trade has largely continued to function, that stocks have been high, that availability has been high, that export restrictions have been largely temporary. Do you think there's a risk that there'll be a kind of complacency coming out of this, that COVID has been a, you know, one of the black swan type events that um, those of us working on food system resilience have signaled and have said that, that countries need to prepare for? 
um, but in fact hasn't hasn't led to the kind of major disruptions to the trade system, at least at international level that we might have imagined. Do you see a risk there, or do you think that um, it will be easier to open up that conversation about managing risk going forwards and anticipating future disruptions and the need to prepare for those? If you want, I, I can start. Uh, uh, it's important to understand that at the beginning of the lockdown, the trade sector was significantly choked. Significant. Remember, when we move about commodities, there are two types of commodities, the staple and high value commodities. The staple commodities were choked not because of labor, because they are capital intensive, but they were choked because of logistical issues. High value commodities were choked because of restrictions of labor and also because they are perishable. So if they don't move quickly, logistical effects are important. But what was important to see is how the private sector reacted so quickly to help to find solutions, working with governments and, and trying to fine tune the logistical operations. There is a still a lot more to do. But I think that the reaction was, is was pretty fast. And that's what helped the, the food to be available in the shelves of the supermarkets and everywhere. It's surprising, but there was not a scarcity of food across the world. Uh, they moved very quickly and they adjusted. And, and we had several meetings with groups of companies. And the way they reacted and the way they fine-tuned the operation was good. And, and that, that shows us some level of resilience. But clearly, that's not enough. Uh, today, we are at risk that one big country, big key exporting country, of a commodity decides to put again an export restriction and that could create significant spillovers. So we need to find ways uh, to minimize the uncertainty in the world. And that's where places like institutions like the agricultural market information system play a crucial role because they bring information on the stocks and availability and we keep pushing that information to the system. This is a G20 mission. Uh, but also we need to have real time information on logistics so that people understand what is going on. So I hope uh, we understand the problem we're living today. We have not resolved at all the problem. We have still COVID-19 everywhere. Uh, and I hope uh, we will now focus enormously in trying to find those ways in which we can increase the resilience of the system. We never focus too much on the resilience of a system as such. We focus on household farmer resilience. So insurance, your insurance for your car is individual resilience. It's not in resilience for a system. And we need to think differently. This is like working in options, working under a world of uncertainty, where we need to have several options. So if, if, if there is an export restriction, okay, where else I can move to import? What are the options? Where are they? So I can move very fast. And that's where intelligence, market intelligence for both exporters and importers is central. Uh, and that's where I think things will move very fast. Of course, there will be changes. Uh, vegetables will start to be grown locally. Uh, those are the, the commodities that travel the lower the distances. And that will get very close so they will get close to urban areas. And why? Because uh, control environments are cost effective. And we will see that change. We will also see automatization, which is a way to increase resilience to labor markets. But that's not enough. We, we need to keep thinking and finding ways in which we can make, because tomorrow the job could be different. That's why I call it surprise. It could be something different that I never expected, like COVID-19, for example. So again, uh, the last thing that we can do is to relax. On the contrary, we need to, to be very active in thinking how to resolve these problems. I agree completely with uh, Maximo that the worst thing that we could do would be to be complacent about the uh, situation. Uh, the fact that the ag sector in terms of primary production and, and, and trade showed resilience does not mean that things could not get uh, very complicated very quickly. And I point to, to two things. For one, uh, Maximo talked about the surprise of the shock. Uh, we have to understand that this COVID crisis is uh, very dynamic. I mean, we cannot assume that there is a beginning and an end. That's why I made the uh, uh, comment at the beginning of the uh, of the session about the optimism that you know there will be something called after COVID, whereas we don't know really. Uh, you know, there could be, and there is apparently already in Europe, beginning to to see it in Canada a second round of COVID spike in terms of infections. Hopefully governments have learned the lesson from the first time around and we are all better prepared to deal with it, both in the uh, health response and the, um, the reaction vis-a-vis -vis the impact on the economy. But there are worrisome signs, and, and I agree with, with Maximo that the worst thing that could happen is to have export restrictions or import restrictions derived from a uh, a, a difficult world political environment, which is in itself linked to the COVID and the economic crisis. I will go back to the comments I made on the US-China trade war. When you have two of the biggest economies in the world, two huge players when it comes to agricultural production and trade, 
you know, the supposed agreement that the U.S. made with China prior to the whole COVID crisis to, to uh, um, remove these barriers on agricultural trade between the U.S. And, and China was promising. But the reality is that we have no guarantee that the, this trade war is going to go away. And despite what the U.S. administration might say, trade wars are not won. They basically hurt both parties, or if it's at the multilateral level, all parties. And so at the end of the day, all uh, countries uh, can, can be severely hurt by this. So I think we should keep an eye on what the progress of the situation in the US-China trade war is. And at the same time, we should not lose sight of the fact that uh, we need to advance in multilateral trade negotiations in agriculture. There was a strong discussion uh, at the WTO in recent uh, months and years on, um, uh, for example, subsidies on fisheries. There is still quite a bit of discussion as to where a government support program should go and uh, a refurbishing or restructuring on uh, government support programs for agriculture in order to facilitate trade and allow what Maximo said, which is really free up the agricultural markets and take away some of these major distortions. Unfortunately, we have grown uh, accustomed over the decades to see such distortions in the agricultural sector. One needs only to look at the uh, situation of the sugar market in North America, for example, where prices in the US and Mexico are kept uh, artificially high through a series of complex regulations, uh, suspension agreements between US and Mexico, uh, um, you know, elements of regulation in each other's laws that maintain prices very high vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And that's just an example of what happens across many, many important commodities. So to have a long-term solution, I really do believe that we must deal with the immediate effects, obviously, of the COVID crisis, try to do away with these major trade wars that are occurring between key players such as the US and China, but also delve into uh, work at the WTO, the FAO, on long-term solutions to eliminate distortions in the agricultural sector. I really think that's, that's the long-term solution to this major problem. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to invite Alan Beatty to uh, turn on your microphone and put your question to the speakers. Hi, good afternoon, folks. Um, can I pick up this question of multilateral um, trade agreements on agriculture? Because as Kenneth just said, some of the um, support programs are designed to push prices up and reduce um, production, but a lot of course, particularly in the US, are designed to encourage production and push prices down, and it's those which, which people have been trying to discipline within the Doha round and elsewhere. Um, and if I recall correctly, it was actually a food crisis in the 1970s which caused the US to shift from production limiting to production encouraging um, farm support for the most part. Now my question is, what you've seen, not just, or not so much during COVID, but actually during the, um, uh, during the food crisis 2007-2008, do you think that has made a material difference on the way that people wish to structure um, subsidies? Because you could, of course, make the argument that it's actually production subsidies that have kept the production going and kept the price down, although it's not particularly the way we would wish it. Um, so I'm just wondering, what lessons do you think people took from the food crisis and what lessons do you think people are going to take from COVID with regard to what they do with subsidies and whether subsidies are, in fact, even if they're technically classified as non-trade distorting green box, whatever, what those, whether there'll be an encouragement to do those kind of subsidies just to keep supply going? Ken, Maximo, I'm going to let one of you jump in. Okay, I can, I can briefly, uh, so look, uh, from the 2007 to 2008 uh, food crisis, there, there were several things that, that we have to learn from. The first thing was the level of uncertainty in the level of production and the stocks that we had. That was a huge lesson and, and the response was AMIS, which I think have done a, a very good job uh, up to now. The second thing was that any potential restriction and distortion, because of the issue of the supply side shock that was happening there because of the drought, uh, was completely exacerbated by responses of countries in terms of export restrictions or reduction of import tariffs, which increased the demand of food to lower prices. Uh, and that completely accelerated the problem and even created uh, an exacerbation of food price volatility, which is the worst that could happen because then farmers 
cannot decide when to when to plant and when not to plant. Subsidies uh, could make sense if they are temporal. If they become permanent, they are creating distortions. Uh, and for example, one of the realities that we face today is that most of the subsidies in agriculture are to staple commodities. While at the same time, we are arguing that 3 billion people don't have access to healthy diets, which means diversity of diets. So it's not only the nutritious content, but also the diversity. So the, 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 the incentives are completely misaligned to, to what is the problem. Uh, and the problem is huge undernourishment and huge levels of overweight and obesity that requires healthy diets and therefore staples are not the solution for that. So, so I, I think uh, one very important lesson that we can learn today is that we need to rethink the way these subsidies are being applied uh, and, and what are the reasons for them uh, and make them more transparent because if at the end of the line is just to create support for local producers, uh, we need to find other instruments that don't distort uh, the commodity markets like they are distorted today. So, so the, the, the mechanisms being used are not aligned to the incentives that they are supposed to be produced for. And that, that we need to rethink carefully. Uh, and I think COVID-19 could open the opportunity to, 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 to change something which has been extremely difficult to change in the past. I do agree. I think uh, definitely subsidies should be restructured. There should be a uh, conscience uh, generating effect, if you will, of the COVID crisis on countries on the need to, uh, we're not talking about eliminating uh, obviously farm support, but actually uh, reshaping the way subsidies are provided and the emphasis that, where they, that is placed in, uh, in, in, in providing these subsidies, whether it is in developed countries or in, develop, or in the developing world. Uh, one of the big challenges is of course, political imperatives and pressures from groups that have grown accustomed over many, many decades to receive um, you know, farm support, which creates distortions, which in a way keeps prices artificially high for consumers, but that does not generate uh, long-term benefits uh, for, for all farmers in the world. So that, that has been a subject of discussion for many, many years in terms of the, the negative impact that, uh, that subsidies can have. I think that uh, there is the possibility uh, to, to modify that. But uh, what we're seeing in many countries is, is uh, walking in a different direction, which is, which is unfortunate. I think if you look at the situation in Mexican agriculture, uh, the government, the new government came in here with a position of uh, uh, pushing for a program of uh, austerity throughout the, the Mexican budget. And that has affected many areas of, uh, of public policy. And in the agricultural sector, uh, supports that were uh, obviously not done optimally in, in the past uh, have gone, I think, in the wrong direction of moving towards uh, clientele politics, uh, just providing direct cash payments uh, to small farmers without a, um, a, a plan to increase productivity or to have programs that promote innovation and technology. And I think in the developing countries, that's the direction that the support should take. And that requires, as uh, Maximo explained before, uh, a change, I think, in the architecture of international institutions, in the, in the focus or of where cooperation activities should take place. I give the example of Mexico because we're in a situation in which we have a tighter budget, but the, the, the amount of uh, support that is spent in Mexican agriculture is not being spent on long-term uh, productivity gains for the producers. It's basically small cash payments that have other purposes, which in our view uh, have to do with electoral politics. And that is something that happens in many countries and that can create a major problem. So, so hopefully there will be a notion of taking a stock of the situation that COVID has created in the agricultural sector, the pressures that we will have over the next uh, years or decades to be able to achieve these targets of food security and hopefully at the WTO, we can have with new leadership and with a reform that's much needed at the WTO, the chance to advance in something that really has not been able to advance over the last few decades, which is uh, subsidies in agriculture. Thank you both. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna start grouping questions. So I'd like to invite Horacio to put his question to Maximo and Ken, but also Cynthia Aguilar, if you could come on um, directly after Horacio and put your question and then Maximo and Ken can address those together. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Max, uh, Maximo and Ken, for the explanations given to us. 
Maximo, I would like to know if what you stress about the importance of uh, improving the information system, uh, both from the uh, technology to be applied and, and this is not my idea, he put it in my presentation, but it's not my idea, but of your, our friend, Dr. Martin Pinheiro, which is, um, would it help for the information clarity and completion to have a better uh, net organized by WTO, FAO, United Nations, etc. cetera? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, this is Cynthia Guilage um, from Clifford Chance. Um, to the speakers, basically, I think you raised the impact of COVID-19 and increasing protectionist policies on trade. Um, in addition, I think there's environmental concerns across the board that are resulting in greater demand for sustainable practices but by many governments, um, some of which do conflict with trade practices as we know them today. So my question was, how do you see this trend impacting the legitimacy of regional and intergovernmental the organizations that are pushing the international trade agenda. Thanks, Cynthia. Ken, Max, no. Yep. Ken, do you want to go first? Can, perhaps I can start just quickly on the on the last question. Uh, the first one I think was directed to Maximo. Uh, I think on on the environmental side, I mean, you raise a, a very interesting issue, and that's I think that's uh, part of the discussion that has to happen in within the uh, structure of the international organizations when you're talking about whether it's at the FAO or the WTO on uh, you know, increasing productivity, adopting technology, increasing trade across uh, countries. Of course, the other side of that is ensuring uh, the environmental sustainability of a productive agriculture. And that's, that's always a balance that has to be struck. I think there has been prog progress over the years in trying to advance on, on finding a balance in terms of uh, the, uh, the structure of uh, you know, global trade in general, in terms of its impact, its footprint that it has uh, on, on carbon, for example, the, the development of uh, uh, carbon markets in, in, in Europe is, is very interesting in that regard. And that's something that other countries should seriously uh, look at and, and contribute in terms of their efforts in trying to, to have a match between the needs for agricultural trade to increase, while at the same time, the stress that that places on, uh, on uh, natural resources and, and the environment. I am not sure what the outcome will be based in the, in the situation of the crisis that we are living. Uh, so, some people in the literature have said that because of the economic crisis, because of the situation with COVID, attention has been taken away from the issue of environmental sustainability in certain countries. And uh, certainly, for example, um, the uh, political situation and some of the key players in the world, such as the United States, uh, will be key to define whether there will be new leadership beginning next year in the United States that could have a different attitude or position vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, global climate change and everything that emanates from that, or whether uh, the U.S. will continue to have this, uh, let's say, negative or denial position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate change and, and, and other elements along those lines. So. Uh, it is not clear to me right now whether uh, we will be able to, to learn lessons from the crisis that we have right now and to really continue to focus as we should on, tr on trying to find this positive balance between increasing agricultural productivity and trade and taking into consideration the environmental impacts. Let me ask, answer first Horacio. So Horacio, I, I fully agree with the importance of information. As, as you mentioned, information is not only data on the stock and prices, uh, although that's extremely important. No? The, one of the reasons we were able to, to make countries uh, move out of export restrictions with COVID-19 at the beginning was because it was clear that food was available and therefore there was no reason to hold, this, hold production because nobody would buy it at the end of the line. There would be alternatives. No? And that work. Uh, so that's, a, that's one issue. Uh, the other issue, how much value added we put to that information. Today we have very good capacity on having predictive power, for example, on predicting prices, of course, or, or predicting even volatility. Uh, and or predicting situations of emergencies that combine information on weather, information on, on pests and diseases and so on. And that's where we need to change. We, we are building up uh, what we call a situation room in FAO to bring this predictive power so that we can help uh, to have that, because that will help enormously to increase resilience, to be prepared for situations. Of course, it will be perfect, but at least it will allow you to understand what is going on in the world market. 
The, the third element, uh, which is linked to this, is information related to, to diseases uh, and information related to food safety standards. That is central for trade and that's central for technology and innovation. And that's where technology can play a crucial role. Blockchain technologies, all the digital innovations that exist today, keeping e-ledgers that will allow us to trace commodities from one location to the other, to allow us to understand what is the value added in each of the stops of the commodity so that we can understand what is happening. That is what will help to accelerate trade. That's what will help to reduce NTVs, non-tariff barriers. The more the transparency we bring using a state of their technologies is what we'll do. And that's where WTO, FAO, and, and WHO can play a crucial role because that's what we need to do. For example, in, in Africa, we are now working on, on trying to help them to develop their Pan-African Food Safety Agency. You know? Why? Because that that's what will help to have this information in place. And, and we need to leapfrog to, to the state of their technology. And the last box is, okay, what are the noise that we know about increasing efficiency in production? And that's pretty complex, no? uh, because there are many, but there is lack of evidence. So today, countries don't necessarily know what are the consequences and the benefits of different technologies so they can make proper decisions. And that's a job for, for FAO, clearly. The FAO now is as a new chief scientist, which her job is to try to to, to identify all the evidence we know about the different types of policies and technologies so that countries can make better decisions, especially developing countries, because normally we get pushed by certain uh, groups of countries for certain types of options of technologies, which not necessarily are the most proper for, for the country. So we need to do a huge effort to try to bring as much evidence as possible so that con countries can make proper decisions. Regarding the question on, on environment, uh, I honestly don't see the mismatch between a, a facilitation of trade and proper use of natural resources. On the contrary, I think one of the core elements behind trade is to allocate natural resources in the best possible way. So if I have too much water, I could produce certain commodities more than if I have very little water. So I, I use more efficiently my resources. Now, the reason why that not necessarily is happening is because of distortions. So there are distortions that make you do certain types of production, which not necessarily is the optimal, like water is for free. There is not a cost for water. We are not incorporating in the commodity we trade the cost of water. And that's a big mistake. So we need to start to figure out how we bring the cost of nature of the products that we export or that we move across the world so that that can be really trans translated in, 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 in comparative, relative comparative advantages, which is what trade is supposed to bring, the optimization of the relative comparative advantages. Now, the move today, I think, is to try to make a and to try to create this, this uh, equilibrium between uh, climate, uh, environment, the level of production that we need to satisfy the demand uh, and the livelihoods, because agriculture and rural areas create a significant level of livelihoods to people. Uh, and that balance requires us to be more efficient. And one of the topics that we, I believe at least that is crucial and that cut, cuts across all the elements is food loss and waste. No? Why? Because if I reduce, I reduce losses, which go up to wholesale included and the producer especially, I am saving and using more efficiently my water, my soil. If I reduce waste, I am avoiding to throw out all the emissions that have been consumed to be able to get that produce into the market, into the retail or the supermarkets. So, so that's one option where countries need to get together. And I think many countries are starting to think very seriously on how to achieve that in the private sector, which is central. But the other thing which is important and is also linked to trade is that the, the, the commitments that we have today for COP22 or, or for the COPs is, is based on country, country commitments and we forget the capacity of trade emissions. So I have countries which are very efficient in producing cattle, for example, like New, like New Zealand, which are restricting the number of production of cattle because they want to commit to reduce emissions. What will happen? That meat will be produced in a country which is more inefficient in producing and creating more emissions. And that's the reason for that is because we cannot create emissions right now because of it was not properly designed apparently during Kyoto. So I think we need to resolve the problem of Kyoto and find ways in which we can make also the market for emissions to work because that's the way in which we can keep allocating more efficiently our resources and the technology that we have in place. Thank you. Thanks, Maximo. Um, we have three questions outstanding and two and a half minutes. Um, Maximo and Ken, are you able to stay on for an additional five minutes so that we can cover those questions? No worries if not. From my side. Okay. In that case, I'm going to ask for quick fire questions and quick fire answers to wrap up the session. So if I could pass the mic to uh, Gloria Hooper and Martin Pinheiro and then Marianne Petzinger. 
and then Maximo and Ken, if you can try and answer all three in a minute or two minutes, that should be fine, right? Gloria, over to you. Hello. Hello, thank you, and thanks to our panelists. Um, the issue of food safety and quality standards and animal welfare in the production system have been heatedly discussed here in Parliament uh, as we are looking at a new agricultural bill and a new trade bill uh, as a result of Brexit. Um, are you satisfied that the COVID crisis is not affecting these standards and, and what controls are in place? And I appreciate that Maximo touched on this in his last reply. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Martin, are you there? Yes, thank you. Very shortly, it's a follow-up question of what Horacio asked and is mainly for Maximo. If, do you think that in the next uh, summit, the global issue will be really dealt with or will be an important part of the summit and not only in terms of global governance of primary production but also on the processing industries the the, the part of the chain that actually has no governance at all Maria. Thank you. Just a very quick follow-up question on WTO reform, where issues around notifications and transparency have been key issues. So I was wondering, with regards to agriculture, whether the panelists have any thoughts on if there is prospect for reform in increasing um, the compliance with agricultural notifications and what specifically could be done on that front. Thank you. Thanks. So, Maximo and Ken, if you can try and truncate your answers into a couple of minutes and these will be your closing remarks. Uh, uh, Gloria, in terms of, of food safety and quality standards and what COVID-19 has created, uh, I think that on the contrary, I think it has created a significant uh, uh, pressure on the agencies to start to work and get together to come up with significant efforts on identifying uh, zoonotic diseases, sources of zoonotic diseases and potential problem of plaques and so on. So I, I think, and I, I really hope uh, this will continue. Uh, FAO has signed a significant agreements with WHO and, the, and OIE uh, to build up uh, uh, new labs uh, that, that will help us to accelerate this process. And, and I think it's central uh, uh, to improve this in developing countries. It's central to use technology to accelerate traceability uh, and to be able to minimize those problems because that is, I at least in my, my perception, uh, uh, one of the biggest problems outside of the political problems on the non-tariff barriers and, and, and which we need to bring significant transparency and that, and, and that is basically linked to the One Health approach. So, so uh, that's, that's where we are going. We have the tripartite which is, is pushing for that and, and, and we're putting a lot of effort on, on, on that. Uh, Martin, uh, you always ask very difficult questions. Uh, the Food System Summit is, is, is a meeting at the end of the line. It's a meeting that is trying to bring awareness and is trying to bring uh, certain actions. Uh, for us, uh, the important thing is how we transform the, the agri-food system and how we move from the meeting to, to real actions and, and create a transformation that is needed. Now, one of the topics that you are referring, which is looking at the upper level of the processing of the chains, uh, and not only looking at the producer side. I, I think we need to look at, at all of them. We need to look at, at the system as a whole. We need to look at the producer side, the consumer side, but also the whole value chain in the middle. Uh, why? Because of, of market structure. Uh, what we are observing is significant concentrations of market structure. So few players, big players that control part of the input supply, that control part of the processing part, that control part of the, of the transportation even. So, so that has to be brought up. Now, in my experience, through the G20s and so on and so forward, it's very difficult to come with a global infrastructure to regulate. What is important to come is with information. Uh, that's what at least I have seen work. Global architectures uh, become too political and too complex. And at the end of the line, to be able to have an agreement are oversimplified to a point which they are not effective. Uh, so for me, uh, one clear solution that we can bring up uh, as part of the summit is to find ways in which we can bring up more information to better understand what is happening in this market structure, how it is evolving, how it is changing, and what we need to do to, to, to make it more efficient. Uh, 
if that ends a certain way in a global structure, that, that could be good. But I found starting on, on, a, on a global architecture will be too complex. It will be blow up before you even arrive to the information. So I would prefer to start with the information part. And finally, on the WTO, uh, I, I think we are in elections of, of the new Director General for WTO. So my, my position there is that it requires a lot of, of, of transformation. The notification system needs, needs to move back to what it was before, needs to accelerate and needs to reform. And there needs to be more balancing of power to be able to achieve that. And, and that, that is something very complex that I think we need to find ways in the architecture in place to, to, to be able to achieve. Thank you. And uh, I will just compliment on the, the food safety and uh, quality issue that was raised. I think that it's a, it's a very important issue uh, within North America with, through the USMCA, uh, there is a important changes that were made on the SPS chapter. I emphasize that in my presentation on the sort of the trade facilitation elements, but at the same time, the, it's uh, reiterated through the USMCA, the importance that the three countries uh, uphold and strengthen their uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures in order to guarantee uh, foods, uh, food safety from the SPS perspective and also from the point of view of the, uh, the, the health rules uh, uh, regarding the quality and, and nutritious aspects of food. In fact, there is a uh, rather controversial uh, law and regulations coming in in Mexico regarding the labeling of processed foods that, uh, that has been uh, implemented in Mexico and uh, which actually uh, stipulates as other countries have done in Chile and others when a food has an excess in certain sugars and f saturated fats, etc. Uh, there's been quite a bit of outcry from the processed food industry in, saying that uh, the regulations are excessive, uh, that the health ministry is use, using the COVID crisis to actually blame a lot of the COVID deaths on processed foods and their impact on, on, the, um, on the human body. So this is an ongoing debate happening in Mexico. I know it's happening in other countries as well. Uh, so that will require quite a bit of work in terms of uh, the future of, uh, especially when it affects uh, how regulation affects the processed foods and its nutritional value. Uh, on the WTO, I do think that the issue of compliance on notification is, uh, and, and other things are, are very important. This has to be part of the reform that takes place in the WTO to really increase the credibility of the institution. I think there should be uh, mechanisms that increase the pressure on countries or establish some sort of compulsory uh, mechanisms to ensure that um, uh, farm supports are notified, that there's transparency of the information that the countries are obliged to provide to the WTO, and, uh, and that is something that, uh, you know, that has been lacking. Uh, especially, I think that since uh, China joined the WTO, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, they're not the only culprits, but on the ag side, it's something that we're, we have seen where, where the system seems to have failed. And with new leadership, as Maximo said, there could be perhaps more consensus building towards, uh, uh, you know, really having a stricter requirements on notifications, on transparency, on the way each, country's, each country provides information, which is very uh, important for the regular trade policy reviews that the WTO has to conduct on many sectors, but especially on the ag sector. So we, we hope this will be one of the priorities going forward in the WTO reform process. Thank you both, and thanks for keeping your answers. Snappy. Um, I appreciate you staying on for longer and a huge thanks um, to you, Ken and Maximo, for your time today. A huge thanks also to Comexi and GPS for collaborating on this event and to the Trade uh, Forum supporters. And thank you to all of you audience members for joining us um, for what I found a really stimulating discussion. Um, many thanks and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>